Welcome to the second half of this drill string and drilling dynamics talk on buckling. In the first part, we looked at how horizontal, cylindrically confined rods, or drill strings, start to buckle under compression, looking both at stability in the horizontal and vertical directions. If you haven't already watched the first part, it will be needed to understand the second half. In the second half of the presentation, I will talk about how a vertical rod, or drill string, buckles and then about how a horizontal drill string can be stable in a helically buckled form in a horizontal well. First, vertical buckling. First I will explain what the problem is, and then look at what has been suggested about the critical buckling load before showing numerical results. Then I will look at buckling in deviated holes, and examine when, for buckling purposes, we should consider a hole deviated. And finally, provide a useful formula. When a drill string hangs in a hole, most of it is in tension. Only the bottom section is in compression. Somewhere close to the bit is the neutral point. The greater the weight on bit, the further back the neutral point. If there is too much weight, then the length under compression will buckle. But what is too much weight? Real drill strings have thick collars at the bottom, because that's the part in compression, and thin drill pipe above, because that's in tension. But to get an understanding of the problem, I'm going to look at the mathematically simpler case of a constant cross-section drill string. This is the equation to use, where f is the weight on bit. Origin of the x coordinate is at the bit, increasing upwards. As you go up the drill string, it goes from compression to tension. Obviously, this has a solution, y equals zero. What we are looking for is a non zero solution, as this will indicate a buckling instability. We can non dimensionalize using the characteristic length L and convert to a non dimensional coordinate z that is scaled by L and origin shifted to the neutral point. This was probably first done by Lubinsky about 1950. What results is an equation for dy by dz, and it's the derivative of a well-known equation, Aries equation, for which the solution is the derivative of an area function. Solving an equation means finding a solution subject to boundary conditions, and we are going to take the drill string as infinitely long, and up at infinity it is hanging freely, which means a pivoting end condition. And then there is a pivoting end condition at a distance zc below the neutral point, where remember z is a coordinate scaled by the normalization distance l. Wang in 1986 showed that for this infinite drill string zc was just over 1, so problem solved. Except of course real drill strings are not infinite. Other authors using other approximations have tended to come up with larger values of zc, so is this infinite limit relevant for real drill strings? There is a hint from the equation that convergence to the limit may be slow. This is the equation. The second term grows with z. So for large absolute values of z, there is an approximation which is to remove the first term, the solution of which is a logarithm. So this hints that convergence may also be logarithmic. Everything so far has been non-dimensional, so what kind of distance is L in the real world? For a tube with a chosen outer radius, the relation between the length L and the outer radius R is given by the formula on the left. For a thin shell, K is one half. For a solid rod, it is one quarter. So for real tubes, it will be between one quarter and one half. For tubulars of typical drill pipe dimensions, L is around 20 meters. For collars, about 40 meters. Because of the one-third power, there is surprisingly little difference between thin-walled pipe and solid rods. We have the equation, and so with a computer, we can numerically solve it and find the critical buckling load versus pipe length. The x-axis is logarithmic in terms of the length L, and as you can see, I was able to calculate for a drawstring up to a length of nearly 1 million L, and it is still nearly 10% away from the Wang limit. For typical L, this corresponds to the deepest hole ever drilled, and this is the Earth's radius. 
This is an entirely empirical formula, which fits pretty well for long drill strings. One caveat. When I was doing this work, I went off in the wrong direction at the start, but was brought back in the right direction after seeing calculations that my friends in the Schlumberger group in Beijing did using IDEAS, the finite element program for looking at drilling statics and dynamics. They use much bigger equations and did not calculate for quite such long drill strings. But for ones where we overlap, this differs by about 4% from their calculations, which is not much, but they should be the same. I never found the source of the discrepancy. Now let's compare the critical bucking loads for a vertical drill string and a horizontal drill string. I'm shifting the origin again for the vertical case to make the equations look similar. The critical load, depending on the drill string length, is between 1.1 times and twice MGL. Now, in a horizontal well, the critical load, the dorsum Paisley load, depends on the length r, the rolling radius of the pipe in the hole. We can non-dimensionalize using the same length as for the vertical case. The non-dimensionalized rolling radius, r over l, is going to be much less than 1. The horizontal critical buckling load is much, much bigger than the vertical buckling load. And in these equations, the drill string length barely appears. For any long length, the actual load will only be very slightly above this limit. We can write down the equation to solve for a hole at constant angle. If we ignore the cos theta term, then it is a horizontal approximation. Ignoring the sine theta term, it is a vertical approximation. and We can calculate the critical load for both approximations an indication of when the real solution is more like the horizontal one than the vertical one will be when the horizontal approximation load equals the vertical approximation load. For 6 inch collars in a 12 inch hole, the ratio L over R is over 200, corresponding to a deviation of 0.4 degrees, so practically vertical. This is all very hand-waving, so real calculations are needed. These are from numerical solutions of the equation shown in blue. This is a transformed version of the deviated equation, and I will show you how this relates to different hole angles on the next slide. What n corresponds to is the ratio of L to the rolling radius R, multiplied by the sine of the hole angle. The normal side force axis is logarithmic. At the left end, n is near zero, so the drill string is vertical. What is plotted is the critical load F minus twice root n, which is zero on the left edge of this graph. For the different drill string lengths, going from eight up by factors of eight to over 262,000, the critical load gradually reduces to the Wang limit, shown as a red cross. As the sine force increases, which is equivalent to the whole angle increasing, all the solutions for different lengths converge onto one line, which asymptotes to about 1.61 at a value of n above 100. For drill strings in normal holes, if the deviation is more than a fraction of a degree, then n is greater than 1. So unless the hole is gun barrel straight and vertical, we could use a formula that is independent of drill string length. From the numerics and the horizontal hole theory, we can get an approximate formula to use, which I am plotting here for 6 inch collars in a 12 inch hole, where for the formula, the length L is calculated at 0 degrees i.e. gravity at 9.8 meters per second squared. The match is near perfect. The only error is invisible here at below one degree, and the amount of error will depend on the length of collars. At this point, I should explain why I am always using collars and not pipe in my examples. In vertical or near vertical wells, the neutral point will be in the BHA, in the collars. If there is a large stiffness contrast between collars and pipe, which there generally is, as the stiffness goes as the radius to the fourth power. The top of the collars looks very much like a free end. So for the purposes of matching the calculations to reality in a near vertical well, we can actually ignore all the drill string above the collars. Let's look at what buckling actually looks like in a near vertical well. In all these plots, the bit is at the origin, and then as the critical buckling load increases with angle, the neutral point is indicated by the red line. All the drill strings are the same length, 20L. For the vertical case, all the deflection is in the same direction, with a maximum just above the neutral point. 
Already at 0.25 degrees, the neutral point position at critical buckling is almost twice as far at the collars. And just above the neutral point, there is a tiny deflection in the opposite direction, but by about eight lengths above the bit, it is virtually undisturbed. As the angle increases, the critical load is also increasing, but the length over which the buckling occurs stays pretty constant at 6 to 8 L, although with the increased load, the wavelength of the buckling curve goes down. Finally, a conclusion based on a mixture of theory and numerics. If you have an extremely vertical well, the critical buckling load depends on the BHA length and is given by this formula. As soon as you have any deviation, this no longer applies, and you could use instead a formula that depends on deviation and not length. Now, what is perhaps the least well understood topic, helical buckling. Exactly how the drill string transitions into helical buckling is going to be complicated, but perhaps we can study when helically buckled pipe is stable. Going back to the results of the first part of this talk, we know that by 40% above Dawson Paisley, the pipe can lift off the hole, and that if for some reason the pipe is taken to the top of the hole, it will stay there. Numerical simulations show the pipe in a helix wrapped around the inside of the borehole. So can we get there analytically, and maybe learn something more? First, I need to recast the equations in terms of angle, not distance. This is the equation for the motion of a uniform circular pipe confined to a cylindrical surface with a rolling radius of r. Ft means tangential force. If the pipe is not constrained to an annulus, but could lift off, then there needs to be a normal side force constraint too. Fn is the normal force. Looking at the tangential force equation, it has the linear fourth and second order terms that we have seen before. But in addition, there are non-linear terms, the first from geometry, and the second from gravity. And then there is the acceleration term in the tangential equation, and the centripetal force term in the normal equation. So the equations we are looking for are tangential force zero, normal force positive. There are multiple ways we can non-dimensionalize, and I spent a long time using the wrong one, but this is the best way. Rescale the distance according to the compression, and then appropriately normalize the gravity term and the motion terms. So there is one parameter for gravity and one for mass, and that's it. Can we find helical solutions? Simplest case first, vertical well, no rotation, and ignoring the self-weight of the pipe. So really unphysical but giving some hints as to the horizontal case. There is a very simple constant pitch solution to the tangential equation for all pitches. However, to have a positive normal force, the magnitude of K has to be less than one. Are these helical solutions stable? To find out, we can linearize the full equations around a helical solution. They are stable only if K squared is greater than one sixth. It's worth just sitting back and thinking about what these solutions mean physically. We have an infinite cylinder under compression, so that in its unbuckled state it is intrinsically unstable. For a range of pitches, that is from 1 over root 6 to 1, and a normalization that depends on the square root of the compressive force, a helix of that pitch is a stable configuration. There's nothing to say exactly what pitch within that range the cylinder will end up in, or indeed whether there are other stable configurations. Now a slightly more general situation, still a vertical well, but we allow the angle to change at constant speed. Physically, the rotation of the helix around the hole might be generated by contact friction from the rotating pipe. The added centripetal force means that a helix of greater pitch is a physical solution. Or viewed another way, a helix with the same pitch in physical coordinates but with a lower compression. That's enough of the simple cases. Now. For a non-vertical well, really a horizontal well, as there is no self-weight. These are the equations, or rather one equation, the tangential force equation, and one constraint. If you multiply through by theta dashed, you can integrate the tangential force equation once to get the next equation. As we might expect, it is for the pitch, theta dashed, squared, as there is no preferred sign to the pitch. 
Now, we want to find solutions to this equation that look like a helix. Not a constant pitch helix, the effects of gravity won't allow that, but some kind of helix. What do we mean by a helix? It is a solution that is not just periodic along the well, but periodic in theta. If it is periodic in theta, then theta dash squared can be written as a Fourier expansion. And furthermore, it must also be positive, as well as the normal side force being positive for a physical solution. Solutions which are periodic, but not helices, may not have a full Fourier expansion, sinusoidal buckling solutions, for instance. They are periodic in the spatial coordinates, but only cover a small range of angles. Looking at the equation to be solved, it is straightforward to see that terms that are order j times theta are also at least order j in the gravity parameter gamma. So we will have an expansion simultaneously in theta and gamma. If we write the pitch squared as k squared plus a correction term, then we can also calculate the other terms in the equation from this. And now we substitute and get going on some heavy algebra. Using formulae for replacing products of trigonometric functions by sums, then this equation results. There is no constraint on the constant term due to the arbitrary k, but there is now a Fourier series where every coefficient must be zero. We can write each coefficient a in terms of product of other coefficients, which doesn't obviously help. But if we now expand each coefficient in powers of gamma, iterative solution is possible. But it is again not obvious that there is convergence in gamma. I'll come back to that in a second, but first let's look at the normal side force. We can substitute the Fourier expansion into the normal side force equation too and get another log expression. It's got the k squared, 1 minus k squared term, as in the vertical case. Then there is a gravity term, helping at the bottom of the hole, opposing at the top, plus a linear compression force, and some non-linear elastic bending terms. It's worth just looking at the lowest order terms explicitly. They are infinite for k squared equals 1 over 6 plus j squared, full j, so k squared must be over 1 seventh. So long as k is larger than 1 over root 7, a bit of work shows that there will be a finite radius of convergence for gamma as the coefficients of gamma are growing polynomially. As well as converging, the squared gradient of theta must be positive. For fixed axial load, Gamma is proportional to the force of gravity, so for any pitch over 1 over root 7, up to a certain amount of gravitational force, there will be a mathematical helical solution, which may or may not be a physical solution, depending on the normal force. In reality, as gamma increases, the theta dash squared expansion goes to zero, and thus fails to be a solution, before the value of gamma is reached at which the expansion fails to converge. Calculating the range of gamma for which there is a physical solution, that is one with positive normal side force, gives this envelope. The dashed magenta line is at 1 7th. On the x-axis is k squared, which is the mean of the pitch squared. On the y-axis, gamma, a non-dimensionalized gravitational force. In reality, gravity doesn't vary, but the non-dimensionalization involves the compression, and as the compression increases, gamma decreases. Just as in the vertical case, there are solutions up to k squared equals 1. If we remove the normal side force constraint, which is equivalent to saying that for some rotation speed there is a solution, the solution envelope does not expand very much for lower k, but rather than declining after about k squared equals a half, it continues to expand. Time to see what these solutions look like. Starting at k squared equals 0.54, which is where there is the maximum range of gamma with physical non-rotating solutions. On the left is the pitch squared, on the right the normal side force, non-dimensionalized. Top of the hole is at the edges, bottom of the hole in the middle. As expected, the normal side force is a maximum on the low side, minimum on the high side. There is a small variation in pitch for this small gamma. High, 
Higher gamma, but same mean pitch squared. There is more pitch variation and more force variation in this non-dimensionalized form. Even higher gamma, right on the limit for normal size force, which drops to zero at the high side. Gamma of 0.4, for which now the normal side force goes negative. So this could be stabilized by rotation. Finally, a non-physical solution with a gamma of 0.5. Everything converges, but the pitch squared goes negative. So the actual physical solution is only over a range of theta for which the pitch squared is positive. So this is not a helix. Negative normal side force as well. So I have no idea if this corresponds to any kind of physical solution. This is the same plot as the last one, except I have rescaled the normal side force so that, so that it is scaled by gravity. For the low gamma curves, the difference between the low and high side forces is about two, i.e. with or against gravity. As gamma increases, this difference persists, although the mean level reduces, as well as more distortion appearing. Now, for a lower value of k squared, where the range of allowable gamma is reduced, I've kept the more physical force normalization. For gamma equals 0.1, the normal side force is looking like a squared off curve. For gamma equals 0.15, there is a physical solution with enough rotation. But now, surprisingly, there is a local force minimum on the low side of the hole. In the other direction of k squared, and a wider range of gamma, the two higher values requiring rotation to be physical. For high gamma, a very wide range of pitch and a quite non sinusoidal force variation. So far, I've just looked at the existence of helical solutions, nothing about how they might arise or how to get there from sinusoidal buckling. And the Dawson Paisley critical load, gamma, is one quarter. Increasing the compression reduces gamma. Remember gamma is gravity scaled by compression squared. Sinusoidal buckling has the pipe displacement periodic in the axial coordinate, covering only a small range of theta. But based on the sinusoidal buckling equations, we could look at what the, pi what the pitch squared is equal to. At the limit of sinusoidal buckling of delta squared of a half, or gamma of about one seventh, the pitch squared is about one eighth, at least at this level of approximation. Remember, there is no smooth transition to helical buckling using these equations, as in an intermediate configuration, some pipe will not be on the side of the hole. We can plot the sinusoidal buckling threshold and the approximate sinusoidal stability limit on this graph. If the compression is slowly increased, the system follows the green solid arrow down, no buckling, as the compression increases. Then, during sinusoidal buckling, it acquires some additional mean pitch squared, although of course it is not in a helix. And then it spends a short while off the borehole wall, before ending up somewhere in the helical buckling envelope. Exactly where it ends up must depend on boundary conditions and as a subject I have not thought about enough to have any conclusions. However, for drilling purposes, helical buckling stops operations, so weight has to be taken off the bit. Note, however, that non-rotating helical solutions exist at lower compression than the threshold for sinusoidal buckling. So once the drill string is in a helix, it likely has to be taken right back to a completely unbuckled state before drilling weight can be reapplied. Unfortunately, there's no complete story here, but I hope quite a lot of illumination. So long as the gravity over compression squared ratio is sufficiently small, helical non-rotating solutions exist in horizontal holes. The smaller the ratio, i.e. the larger the compression, the wider the range of mean pitch squared that is possible. The mean pitch squared limits are between one seventh and one, although below one sixth is unstable. There are non-rotating helical solutions, even at gravity over compression squared ratios, where the pipe is not susceptible to sinusoidal buckling. 
implying that it can stay in this state even after the compression has gone below the dawson paisley threshold. Friction-induced rotation enables a wider range of helical solutions, particularly for large pitch. Numerical simulations do tend to show an earlier jump to helical buckling as the rotation speed increases. The next presentation is the final one, where we move on to lateral dynamics in horizontal wells. As always, questions and comments to the email on the lower right.